It is uh, 7 o'clock. I will call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, the 21st of October, 2024. The first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I will note that uh, in the um, consent agenda, there's a approval of an agreement with uh, Jim Barlow our uh, attorney uh, to conduct a tax sale. Uh, is, so we don't often see in the consent agenda, but I think it's uh, certainly within the realm. Uh, so I just wanted to call that to your attention. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the uh, agenda is approved as written. Next is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Take it away. Uh, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The consent agenda is approved uh, as written. Next is a public session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warrant agenda, I, I ask you to please come forward and. Uh, Please keep your uh, remarks to three minutes. Anything more than that, they'll be glad to put it on a, uh, the agenda on the uh, succeeding meetings. Any hands from mm -hmm. Zoom? No? Nobody hearing it? Okay. Moving through it. Next is uh, the Town of Waterbury's reappraisal uh, proposal. Dan Sweet, Lister. Yeah, would you mind coming forward? Sure. Would you mind just introducing yourself for the record? So, I'm Dan Sweet, the Town of Waterbury Assessor. So, uh, in your packet, I think you all received uh, sort of an outline of the reappraisal um, titled Waterbury Reappraisal 2026. It goes through the for the steps, why we're needing to do this. Um, we've met a threshold in our sales to assessment ratio um, that exceeds the state mandated minimums. And so we are now mandated by the state uh, Department of Taxes to embark on this reappraisal process. Um, it's gonna be a full year process. It's gonna finalize April 1st of 2026. Um, the last reappraisal was conducted in 2014, so just about 10 years ago. Um, right now we're in the process of doing sort of sales review, market analysis, see where the market's going. Um, and once we get all of our cost tables, land schedules finalized, we're gonna start the process of doing home inspections, which is the big, the bulk of the work that, that occurs. There'll be a lot of uh, public outreach letters direct to property owners to schedule those home visits. Um, the anticipation is that we get into at least 50% of the homes. There's varying data that that's a optimistic, <laughs> optimistic number. Um, but we're going to be shooting for that. It was part of the recent Stowe reappraisal, and I think we were in actually 60% of homes. So is there pretty a, positive. a minimum number that you try to get into? I'd like to get into at least 50. NEMRIC, New England Multiple Resource uh, Center, who does a lot of statewide or townwide reappraisals, are seeing numbers in the 25, 30% range. So okay. I'd like to be double that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's possible. Um, so that's going to continue all the way up until early of 26, um, followed by the normal procedure of grievances. Hopefully there aren't many, hopefully the few go beyond grievance process, but there's always a couple. Um, right now we're seeing um, our sales to assessment ratios, half of what sales are, our assessment ratios are about half of what sales are showing. And so the anticipation is that, although there's no guarantee, 
we would expect that post reappraisal values to be twice of what they are currently. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that range. And what sort of support are you going to need for this? Uh, we have a reappraisal fund. Um, we're going to, I'm going to need to have at least two part-time people. Um, and what that ultimately looks like is um, sort of depends on who, who's in agreement to come in, uh, in the assistance side of it. Um, as an example, I've had some, some informal discussion with uh, our previous assessor, Tom Vickery. Mm -hmm. um, a person like that would, would be able to do a pretty heavy lift. Um, is he available? He's, as I said, informal discussions. Okay. Um, and he's, he's been positive, but we don't have any, we don't have a formal agreement at this point. Um, so that's sort of next step is get somebody like that in place. Um, otherwise there's, you know, I've got some, some agreement from listers to do home inspections, um, which are a pretty standard and easily trained uh, part of the whole process. Pictures, verifying existing data, updating data as necessary, that sort of thing. Other questions? Oh. Um, couple of couple of questions. Um, I don't want to get ahead of where we are. Um, sure. Mark Fryer made a comment at a meeting a while back, and he was concerned that, um, and, and this happened in Burlington, um, Burlington reappraised during COVID, so homeowners got hit with a tax increase because commercial values were way down. Do you, you have, can you, without put, pinning you, you know, down, can you comment on that at all? And, and is there any, anything big for Waterbury that you could see coming? Well, there's, I can't see, I mean, if I could predict the market as it moves forward, man, I'd be doing pretty well. Um, but, you know, there doesn't seem to be a major disparity between um, commercial sales or residential sales. They're all sort of selling at that almost twice what our current assessment values are. Okay. So I'd expect that they would all rise about the same amount. You know, we may have some um, categories that, that come up a little bit higher. Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of categories within it, a town. R1 are properties, residential properties less than six acres. R2s are residential properties with greater than six acres. And so as an example, those parcels with a greater land base may come up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all gonna be teased out in our, our study process. So we'll know more as that, that process is, is concluded. And then um, I know I've heard Reappraisal is talked about in the context of neighborhoods. Um, so different neighborhoods might have different uniform values than others. Um, will Waterbury have that approach, or is it just Waterbury? Uh, Waterbury has that has that arrangement as it is now. Okay. So different areas of town have what are called different neighborhood codes, and it's basically a, it's a multiplier on our basic land value is what it starts out as. You, know, you can think about various areas of town. As an example, <coughs> floodplain properties have a uh, uh, economic depreciation value recognizing the impacts of the flood. Um, so their values are lower relative to an exactly identical property that would, it's not in the floodplain. A, a property that's up on Wood Farm Road, as an example, is going to have a higher multiplier than a property that's that's sort of right down in the center, and it's it's all based on previous sales data. Okay, and then just correct me if I'm wrong here. This is the way I've always understood it, but you you get in enough properties, so you have this table of values, and it's uniformly applied. So. You know, it's a dollar per square foot for kitchen space versus living room versus basement. And so if someone then comes into zoning and says they're going to build something, 
we can tell them exactly how much their property value is going to increase because hey, you're adding on a deck. It's got an automatic, you know. It gets a little, little trickier than that because if you're adding on a deck to a double wide, mm -hmm. it's a different deal than if you're adding on a deck to a two-story, 3,000 square foot home. That deck on the two-story, 3,000 square foot home is going to be of a higher value per square foot basis than on the double wide. And so there's some discrepancy there. Could be the same size deck, mm -hmm. but just by virtue of that <coughs> being attached to a double wide, you're going to have less per square, square foot value. Okay. And then I promise this is my final one. Well, um, cost right. approach versus market value approach. Right. Um, any different in how you approach, uh, let's say, you know, you're on Loomis Hill and there's two houses almost identical. One is single family home and one is an Airbnb. They're both structures residential are, structures. And so they're treated the same okay. as a residential structure. The replacement cost for the Airbnb is the same as it is for the single family home. Okay. You know, and what they're used for is doesn't really enter into the, my equation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, you know, when you say that uh, the uh, sales uh, to assessment uh, ratio is uh, more than double, uh, some people will interpret that to think that their taxes are going to rise because right. the value of their property uh, right. will be good. assessed at maybe potentially <laughs> twice the value. But I think uh, my interpretation is if uh, the select board and Tom keep uh, the spending of the town at relatively modest levels, uh, right. the impact on the taxpayer will not be greatly inflated. Right. From a municipal standpoint, if you're, if you're having to raise a million dollars, you're still raising a million dollars next year. Everybody's value may be double, but you're not having to raise double the money. Right. So your, your tax rate can be cut in half if everybody's property value doubles because the whole grand list doubles in size. Mm -hmm. But what you pay is going to be about the same. There you go. <laughs> that's an important point. I just wanted to yeah, put that excellent point. Because, you know, that's, when yeah, people, it, you say reappraisal, people get nervous. People and get very nervous. And that's my experience working in Stowe. That was the biggest conversation that every house we went that I went to was <coughs> talking about the tax rates. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember that the municipal and the education make up the tax bill. The municipal side is pretty straightforward. The education right. part, <laughs> not so straightforward. <laughs> Questions? Not a, qu not a question, just a point, but are elected listers um, get paid, five, I think, five, 500 bucks a year? Um, sounds like they're going to be called upon pretty heavily the next few years, so perhaps it should be under consideration increasing that stipend just a bit. Great. And we can have that discussion as we get into that side of it. And I don't know how, how available the listers are. If the listers say, you know, we are max, I know that some of our listers are also working uh, their own professions. Um, so if we have to go outside to find data collectors, that's what we'll have to do. But you're right, if, if the listers step up <coughs> and say, yeah, this is, I can do it. Sense. What's the competition going to be? Uh, I assume that if Waterbury is uh, triggered this ratio, then the other communities across the state have as well. Yeah. Seventy percent of the towns in the state have been ordered to do reappraisal. Right. <coughs> so, and probably more now. It's uh, it's a pretty huge. If we were to go outside of the town to try to get somebody <coughs> to come in and do this uh, third party. They're scheduling to 28, 29 before they even start. So. Okay. And Tom, we have, uh, uh, I think it was 200,000 from ARPA funds that set aside to cover this? Uh, we have 200,000 reappraisal reserves, yeah. Okay. Right, the reappraisal dollars are a state, state amount given every year mm -hmm. per parcel value every year, which has not changed. The amount that they give per parcel has not changed since. 04, and there's a discussion that that would be appropriate to adjust at this point. 
but that's a state decision. That's a state yeah. decision. And the town makes contributions too towards yeah. it. Mike, yeah. Dan, I know it passed reappraisals. Um, well, I know sometimes, you know, I've been through several of them <laughs> living here a long enough time. Sure. Uh, they say they're going to visit your home. Usually they never do. They might, they might swing by and say, looks, looks about the same. Is that going to be the process again? Because I know a lot of people, are, it's, it's difficult for them to get, you know, especially people who are working, right. to get them home, you know, home and stuff like so, that. Um, Again, my experience most recently in, in Stowe, there's a lot of people working from home these days, That's which true. has made the job a lot easier. Right. Um, we will, we will out, uh, reach out to homeowners at least a couple times, and then the third go-round we'll be knocking on doors, um, all in an effort to, to get the best data we can so right. we can fairly represent everybody's property. Um, if, if a homeowner refuses, that's their they're right. Um, if they don't respond, we'll make every effort. But if they don't respond, we'll you know do what we can. Take a picture from the driveway, and right. and make notations as best we can. You know, re respecting their privacy, etc. Thank you. Yes, I don't know. Follow up on that. So, sure. in your experience in Stowe, how long did a home appraisal take? It's pretty quick. I mean, it depends if there's people home. It can, if you yeah, get right. chatting, sure. you, they have lots of questions. It can be an hour. Yeah. Um, it can be half an hour. It can be if you're just taking pictures, doing a walk around, making notations. It can be a 15, 20 minute deal. You know, there's the data entry on top of that. So you know, typical probably an hour per okay. per parcel. Um, and follow up. How will you be contacting uh, residents? So, so we'll do um, an initial announcement posting everywhere, uh, all the typical places, probably front porch forum as well. Um, and then we will do direct mail, so to address on record. Yeah. Um, you know, give people an opportunity to get back to us. Um, we'll follow up probably a couple months after um, for those that have not responded. Yeah. Um, but it's been pretty, it was pretty effective okay. in my experience. Other questions? Chris? Uh, more of a uh, curiosity question than anything. Uh, have you seen any indication of, probably too early in the game, uh, more listings because of the doubling of appraisals? People thinking, you know, I do think I'm not going to stick around for the uh, tax impacts on this or Well, you know, it's interesting. We've we've seen um, you know, we were, for the last year and a half or so. Well, probably since COVID, uh, we were running in the eight, nine, ten listings. Uh, before COVID, we were in the thirties uh, for active listings, um, and now we're sort of creeping up into the the twenties for a number of individual unique listings. So we're starting to see a little bit of additions to that. Maybe the market's not moving quite as fast. Um, it's a little hard to tell. Well, I'm wondering if this, if the market is still as hot as it was, and you know, within reason, if that if the new reappraisals are going to accelerate the problem that got us here to begin with. Uh, and to Roger's point, when we talk about the municipal tax rate, my bigger concern is what are the schools going to do? this happens, are they going to look at this as a potential windfall to recover some of what they were voted down on in the last budget session or before to try to make up ground on it because thinking that it's, you know, when we get all this additional high revenue source now. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not going to Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> things going through my head, you know. Yeah. And we may end up having to somehow deal with it. So, uh, Mike. I just want to respond to, you know, having been, I used to be a federal appraiser, and having very familiar, <coughs> the tax rate for reappraisal, if everyone's tax, their property values goes up twice, 
it's going to have almost a zero effect on you because everyone's going to be double their, 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 their evaluation and it's all a percent. So it's not, you know, I know it's, it's the fear factor. Is yet my property is going to be double. They, they're thinking my taxes are going to be double. And that's not really, you know, you know, maybe we need to have, and I don't know, Tom, an education process that that's not going to be the case. Because even if everyone's property goes up, say, uniformly 50% or, you know, or 100%, whatever it is, you know, if, every, if everyone's going up that way, it's not going to really have an effect. It's all, only ones that are going to have a really change in their property that they have some more, you know, they added on to their house or, or did something that's really not apples for apples. You know, Mike, I don't think you can say that enough. Right. Um, and, uh, but it's fear factor. factor. It's fear factor, you're right. And the, the initial notice to the town, town taxpayers, it's going to be part of the notice. It's going to be part of the notice in, in the letters, the outreach letters. Right. So that it hopefully, you know, by repetition, it will, it will hopefully it'll allay some of those fears. Yeah. Good. So, um, I think the quite two two things. I guess one would be that would be true if every town's reappraisal goes up the same amount, right? But because the education funding makes up a large part of our tax bill. If the water rate doubles and the other 70% of the towns that are going under reappraisal do not double, that could shift an additional burden to our town. So I think that there is a legitimate fear that people can rightfully have based on the education funding formula, which hasn't been addressed yet. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask you guys was, what did it cost us to reappraise in 2014? Just out of curiosity. I don't, I don't, I don't know that number. Anybody around? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Based on your proposal, uh, you'd be concluding uh, in 2026? That's correct. And then, so it would be the 2027 tax bill that would be in the 2026 <coughs> tax bill. 2026. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I don't think we need reaction on this right now. Do we? No. 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 Yeah, go ahead. 2014, we didn't do it. I wasn't here either. Yeah, I, I, I just don't remember anyone coming to my house. <laughs> well, no, I, think, I, I think Mike's well, just said something similar. I think Tom. Yeah. Vickery. Well, a lot of times they didn't. I usually, I, I never had people. Yeah. You know, they may have come by and took a picture, but I never met with you know the appraisers or, or listers or anyone. You know, especially they, they might. I think of one appraisal. They call and say, "Is there anything different in the, in the house?" Well, I no, do remember no, right. Tom Vickery yeah. coming in right. like oh eight. Well, I think right, to the best of my knowledge, I think. In 14, Tom did the whole thing solo, right. no assistance for, from anybody. I'm sure right. there was, there were, <laughs> you know, priorities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Good so thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, the emergency shelter. Uh, Something light. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I will say that uh, I was approached by the administration, uh, but not on this issue. Uh, I was approached by a &R to see if uh, we had any comment on their recently adopted management plan for the Worcester Range. Uh, and uh, had planned to have uh, someone come here. Unfortunately, a &R didn't have any representative who was available tonight. So we're going to have to uh, reschedule that for November possible to get somebody to come. And, uh, there is interest uh, on the conservation board and perhaps on the planning board as well for that one. But back to the uh, emergency shelter. Uh, there have been a couple of reports in the Waterbury Roundabout uh, that uh, the uh, administration has uh, is looking for to connect with the community uh, about this issue, uh, but that has not 
materialized as of yet. I think Tom has reached out to uh, Commissioner Winters about this, and uh, the information we have is that at this moment there is no Got an update, to, got an oh, update okay. today. Let's, so let's get the update. <coughs> as of just a few hours ago, the update is that the state is going to attempt to open a shelter with state employees, uh -huh. which we have said all along we don't they don't need a zoning permit for that. Uh -huh. So the the attempt is to open it November first, which Chris hinted is probably a long shot to get that done. Um, and it would be for families only. Um, um, tentatively 10 families November 1st is their goal. And then my understanding is um, may operate for some time if they're able to operate it at all, but then um, come December the hotel program opens up in a bigger way so then, the, and these folks are likely the eligible for that. Voucher program. So 30 days, potentially? Potentially. Potentially, they, um, they, I haven't asked them about that. I know they, That's all right. No, I know it's they've had a, some, yeah, right. it's a great question. Yeah. I know they've had some conversations about mm -hmm. transporting the kids to their schools so mm -hmm. they're not impacted. Um, I'm not sure all that's possible. Um, I also want to say that <coughs> no one at this table found out about the state's proposal um, really beforehand. I found about it the day before it hit the press um, in the evening because one of the nonprofits they called to see if they could operate the shelter called me and said, by the way, here's the phone call I got. This was rather interesting. It wasn't a nonprofit that could operate the shelter, um, but I knew then Mm -hmm. Something was brewing, um, obviously. Um, I also want to note that I won't say much about it, but on, but on October 28th, we have our preliminary hearing in the Environmental Division to discuss the permit requirement related to their prior proposal, which they have continued to pursue their legal options. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. Well, good. Thanks for the update. Um, right. And we've had a couple of statements from our state representatives on this, so yeah. basically the same fact. Okay. I just wanted a uh, clarifying question. They, families only, 10 families, they plan to, their tentative plan is to get this thing off the ground November 1st with state employees as operators? Yes. Okay. Just okay. They have been unable to identify a nonprofit op operator. Something, and that was the same as last year, something I, I said to Chris Winters, who's the commissioner, and I said this to him, you know, 10 months ago is that my understanding is the state can apply for a permit and that doesn't jeopardize their case about whether or not they need a permit in the first place. And if they applied for a permit and went before the DRB as anyone would, um, even if they don't intend to have a nonprofit operator in the short term, that permit is valid for several years. And I suggested to Chris that um, I think it would be good if they did that. That way, um, they have the option, but, but moreover, they've gone before the DRB in, in a public setting and, and been vetted related to that permit requirement. How long would that take, though, if uh, you uh, came in tomorrow and uh, <coughs> put down $50 in the permit, uh, um, permit request? You know, they've got to notify butters, all that. Um, you know, usually by the time you given your completed application, it's usually um, three months before you're on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And then the DRB, I believe, has, don't quote me on this, but I believe 90 days to make a decision. That's if the hearing is completed and not continued. So it's maybe three, three Maybe months. a shorter. So, so it could be three to four months. Sorry? 45. 45, okay. I said don't quote me, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's, it's three months to get before the DRB? And then, roughly, and then, roughly. And then another a month and a half to respond. Yeah. So in general, it, it takes some time, but certainly if they were considering a nonprofit operator back last winter, it would have been adequate time to get the permit, which at least then gets them in the clear. And they don't have any kitchen facilities at the... Uh, <coughs> No, um, they, they do, don't they? Didn't they? Yeah, they do. They I don't recall that. Yeah. It's a very nice kitchen. They installed kitchen. Yeah. 
Yeah, my recollection from going in is it's it's essentially cubicles right now. Yeah. So, you know, it's more designed for single persons rather than families. I don't recall any larger spaces where, you know, you might have parents and kids um, sleeping nearby, but I suppose wooden walls can be taken down as easy as they can be put up. There is, there's office space that FEMA was just using. It's a yep. big open room mm -hmm. in one space. I don't know if any of you went into it during the FEMA thing, um, but there's a separate room where the FEMA people were set up at tables and desks. Um, and then the, the wooden thing in the middle is like stalls. It's not, I wouldn't yep. even call it cubicles. It's just the walls are like that high. Yeah. And it just mm -hmm. delineates space. We have pictures of it on our website. Um, if you look on that, on that story, Okay, I guess my question was just going to be off the top of anyone's head. Uh, do we have, I've never heard of the state oper uh, operating a uh, challenge like this with state employees before. I have. Last winter they opened up four facilities. They uh, did with the national, three or four facilities with the, the national, national Guard. Guard. That's what I yeah, thought. Yeah. No yeah. one came. Yeah, there was no demand for it. Um, so do we think the National Guard will operate this one? From, from a legal perspective, I think they're within their rights to do that um, for the zoning permit requirement. Um, you know, if they're using other state employees, most of those folks are unionized, so mm -hmm. they'd have job description issues they might butt up against. It's probably a real challenge. Um, I don't know how they plan to do it. I'm not certain they can do it. They may have DCF employees, you know, mm -hmm. run it. Yeah. Governor said they were going to get creative. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just so that those 10 families, that's coming from Chris? Yes. And it sounds like they're, they're already signed up, ready to, I mean, it sounds Some, like a firm number. It sounds like they're trying. Okay. I'm not sure they, I think, I think probably the challenge is the employee piece and who's going to do it. Hmm. Yeah, wouldn't be surprised if, if Mission was told he was going to do it. Yeah. Getting there is uh, his problem. I think that's quite accurate. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Have have they indicated the potential demand for use of the Waterbury space versus some of these other spaces that they're opening? I, I just don't know. I have a question in my my mind is that because of some of the services that we don't have here, that families who are homeless might prefer to go to other locations where there are more services. Well, it was interesting because at a press event last week, um, homeless advocates were not in favor of this option, um, which was, I thought, quite obvious. They were not in favor of this option at all. Who um, was not? The homeless advocates in yeah. general. Um, yeah. Secondly, the, the other piece that was noted was that the, the three facilities the, the state intends to open in the short term are all in central and northern Vermont. And so mm -hmm. there's we're the farthest south of anything. So um, some of the folks in, in, you know, Rutland has a homeless problem. We're, I think, a little upset about that. Um, so I think everyone realizes if they can pull this off, it's a pretty imperfect solution. It's probably very short term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they identified three uh, facilities. Uh, right. The old West, Wollaston Barracks, uh, our armory, and then a place to be determined in uh, Montpelier. Montpelier. So. Right. Any other questions on this one? We don't have any action necessarily to take, but uh, it was uh, something that came in front of us, so I thought we should uh, open it up to, to the public and share what information we have. We'll move on. Um, discussion of municipal police. Uh, this was uh, a, a request that came during the public session uh, about a month ago uh, after uh, there was a number of uh, really relatively low level crimes happening uh, over the Labor Day weekend. Uh, I say relatively low level, but uh, for anyone impacted, I'm sure made a different impression. And, and, one, was, one, and one very high level crime. Uh, Okay, recently. Well, Reece, very recently. Very recently, yes. yes. Recently. yes. No, 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 I was talking yes. before. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, anyways, uh, this has been something that uh, we've been looking into. Um, 
And uh, Tom, if you wouldn't mind just sharing with us a bit uh, about some of the research that you've done about the feasibility of uh, what, what might be feasible in terms of operating a municipal <coughs> police force. So first off, just starting with the state police, our contract does have an out clause for either party, um, essentially no fault out clause. It also has the ability to add troopers. Um, I would say it's poking out a half million dollars a year for two officers, so if you wanted to add a third, if they have the officer and you have a quarter million dollars you're willing to spend, that's a possibility. I don't think that's a possibility in time in the short term, even if the town had the money because they simply don't have the officers. Had a pretty long chat with Lieutenant Howard a couple weeks ago, and recruiting classes at the barracks um, remain pretty dismal. And um, from talking to him and some other towns, I think, and, and every town is short officers beyond where they ever thought they'd be. Um, most every town that I've spoken to in Vermont has now gone to zero coverage for portions of the evening, the late night when hopefully not a lot occurs. Um, you know, Washington County right now is one officer on in the middle of the night for the entire county. Um, part of the challenge is, you know, that the barracks is, you know, it's a sort of a quasi-military style training. It's poking at six months and it's not a lot of leave passes in there. And so if you are, um, that might work fine if you're a young person, but I think if you're a little older and have laid down some roots or have a family, you're not really interested in, in you know, passing that bar to become a cop. And, and But until that changes on some level, I think it's, um, I think recruiting classes will be limited, because, and I think that's a demographic issue we have now. Um, I just can't imagine, you know, having a spouse or kids and, and walking away for a job for that length of time. I think that makes it really tough. Maybe that's my personal take on it, but all our neighboring towns, even regional towns, are really short, generally at half staffing. Um, Richmond used to have a PD, small like Waterbury's Village. I think they had four or five, and they are no longer in the business. They are contracting with Heinsberg. Um, Montpelier, Stowe, and I have quietly reached out to Montpelier, Stowe, and Berlin about some um, future coverage, some sort of contractual coverage, some sort of partnership, um, potentially even a joint force, just ideas to talk about in the future. And the Berlin police chief, I think, is interested. I haven't had a conversation with the select board. The town administrator position is, I think, in the process of being filled. Um, Montpelier and Stowe are just at half mass, and so they're not, just no point in having a conversation whatsoever. Um, they're, so they're trying half, to half, half their, uh, half their normal, yeah. Um, I think regional forces um, work better. Um, I think if you, if you look at policing in most of the larger towns and remote departments, um, you see a fair amount of shifting. Um, Cops go from Essex to St. Albans or Winooski and other places, and they, to some extent, it's just a change of scenery. You know, they all have union contracts, so they're all competitive in terms of wages and benefits. I don't think they tend to jump ship for an extra 50 cents an hour. I think it's sometimes just a change of scenery that drives it. Different people, different roads, different chief, perhaps. Um, but one of the consistent complaints you have about, you, you hear from police and, and departments is that. You know, we're a series of small towns, and there's there's a benefit to being regional. You get to, you know, divide your towns instead of a town into different zones, and, and you can patrol different areas. And it just adds an element of, of you know, newness and perhaps excitement to the, to the job. So I think having a regional department makes some sense, but we simply, you know, we have to have a willing partner to dance with there. And that's a real challenge when everyone is so short-staffed. So I've, I've had those conversations quietly. Um, I just don't see them bearing fruit for a long time, if they do at all. Um, I can certainly research um, the possibility of starting a Waterbury department if there was any interest in that, but it's, it's a very expensive proposition and, and something that goes with any transition, whether it's Waterbury starting its own department or Waterbury joining forces with someone else, is you have to pay a substantial amount up front 
to buy the equipment and train the officers. So if I were to tell you today, Berlin, Stowe, Montpelier, whoever is interested in a partnership, um, I would also tell you that on year one, you're writing a big check for no coverage whatsoever. And that's the reality of it, because we've got to recruit and pay for those recruits to go to the academy, and you pay them an officer's wage and benefits that entire time. So any changes, um, expensive to the point where we're talking, you know, probably not cents in a tax rate, probably more like a dime on the tax rate, just to, or, or perhaps, you know, 25 cents even, but we, we should think in those, in those big terms. Um, you know, the, the town, if a change like that were to occur, where the town goes back to um, having its own police force, you know, consistent with what the village had, think of the school tax increase that you just experienced and apply that to the town's taxes, and that's probably where you're at. And I'm not being unrealistic, I'm just suggesting it's a big number, um, trying to be really upfront about that. So that's something I can, I can entertain and work on. Um, my, I guess my impression of the state police contract is um, we are served reasonably well. I think Lieutenant Howard and the officers are really doing their best. Um, you know, the biggest challenge is two officers is 80 hours on paper, but officers get leave time. Officers require training. So on an annual basis, it's, a qu it's, it's quite a bit less than the roughly 4,000 hours you would get. Um, and that's just always the challenge you would get um, from any contract with the state. You know, I think perhaps in, in a few years, if recruiting gets a little better, we could get some improvement there, but um, I don't see any change happening there for some time. Thanks, Tom. Questions? So I didn't comment on the homeless issue there because I think this dovetails part of what I want to talk about. Um, you know, I've got some pretty big concerns about our community moving forward. Um, I was up to Barry the other day. I went up and bought a new pair of boots because the uh, soles were falling off my other ones. I was at Wendy's for 20 minutes. And in that time, when I was coming out of the store, a woman passed me and falling all over herself, and she clearly wasn't drunk. She was on something. I walked out the door. Before I could get in my truck, another woman came around the backside of my truck and said, excuse me, sir, do you have any money for food? Well, I won't repeat what I said to her, because I've had it up to here with what I've seen go on in our communities, our adjacent communities, our neighboring communities. And did any of you hear uh, 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 WBDB this morning at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock? They actually touched on the homeless and the drug issue and the, and the police issue. Uh, Rutland is struggling right now. They've got over 700 homeless people down there. Mulvaney and Burlington, after defunding the police uh, for too long, um, now is desperately trying to recruit more police officers. But the goal is for them to carry a bouquet of flowers as opposed to a gun. That's why they're named not getting any response. Nobody wants to be a police officer under those circumstances when one side of the aisle has fully armed and, and you're supposed to deal with, a, deal with them with kid gloves. Your little example of uh, the trailer park death there, um, the guy that's still in the hospital worked for me for some time years ago. Um, there's a lot of answers, a lot of questions that need to be answered before we stepped into something like this. You know, I, I, what, what spurs my curiosity is, has there been a, uh, an attempt at solving the homeless issue that's actually uh, bared fruit? Or is it just a, a, a sinkhole, a black hole that just sucks everybody in and there's no way out? Um, to your point about, you know, recruitment, then there's always the problem of if we even did get 
police officers were recruited, how long are you going to hang on to them for? Somebody else steals them. And what is that cost going to be to keep them? <coughs> and then the biggest picture, the biggest problem is the results. The results of having a police force when their hands are tied. That's the other reason. So I'm going to ask the select board tonight, you're not going to want to hear this, but if we're looking to, if we're going to just walk the path that all these other communities have, thinking that you're going to get a different results, then we shouldn't even be having this conversation. It's going to take some serious uh, uh, movement in a different direction. I don't know what that is. I don't have the time to, I'd love to spend the time into looking into like rehabilitation, uh, drug rehabilitation centers. How many of those people that come out of those drug rehabilitation centers that are actually rehabilitated, and for every one that comes out, how many are going in? Uh, the revolving door that the lieutenant spoke about, what are you going to do to end that? So I'm going to ask you, and I started to ask you, to consider this. You're going to look at me like, ain't no way. I would like to see a vote of no confidence, a vote of, of no confidence for our legislative body at the State House when it comes to the drug problem, the crime problem, and the homeless problem. Because clearly they don't have any solutions because the communities are only getting engulfed and they're dying. People in Burlington, it was right on the radio this morning, the voters are scared right to death up there. You know, it's not, what we're doing is not making the pendulum swing. And I don't want to be a victim of doing the same thing that these other communities, when there's example after example of failure there. Well, I don't think uh, Waterbury has gone in the same direction. As no, no. I get that, Roger. We're blessed right now with our circumstance, but I think you can see, you know, Barry Town's got a, a, a police full-time police department, department. But you drive down through Barry any given day, and it's like uh, attack of the zombies. They're everywhere on the streets. Oh, well, definitely our problems. And, uh, we should be yep. following them to our attention. Thank you. All right. Well, Tom, Tom again, thanks uh, for the analysis and the work that you've done to, to look at options. Uh, I don't see that there's much of a better one than the one that we've, we're, we've pursued today. Or even one available. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Right. right. And meanwhile, uh, the state police have, we have signed a contract for uh, another year and a half for uh, the uh, state Three years. Three years. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got that. Yeah. Any other comments on this? I'll just yeah. briefly say that, yeah, I mean, considering the, the um, education taxes, I think any move in this direction seems uh, pretty laughable and kind of silly for us to even consider yeah, putting any time into that. We're facing a hard reality right now, and we really need to make it harder on ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, I just for the sake of pointing it out, this has been brought to our agenda because a local business owner was concerned about being burglarized, as local businesses have been burglarized, and I just and want shoplifting. To, and shoplifting and all sorts. Um, and I just want to call attention to the fact that <clears throat> we're we're not talking about this for the sake of talking about it. We're talking about it because business owners are concerned about their businesses. And though we don't have a solution at the local level right now, because as Tom pointed out, the police just don't, the police that are working and do exist uh, are doing the best they can um, wherever they need to be. But outside of that, there's just not the bodies to recruit for a police force. We're doing what we can here. And if, Local business owners feel like that is not enough. They can, of course, come back. Mm -hmm. and we can talk it over again. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I just worry about long term the, re the potential. If we, if we did consider doing a police department, the revolving door. You have 
few officers. You know, again, they may be going elsewhere. You need more people from the, uh, the academy. And I just wonder if we're going to be anywhere. You know, I probably would almost, if, if it really gets that bad, I would more entertain maybe adding some hours, you know, for our state police contract. The thing that does, you know, it's, it's beyond our control is it's really the judicial system is that people who commit these crimes it's they're in they're out i i you hear on the news these people who've been arrested they've been, they've been arrested for a hundred times i said you know to me if you've been arrested 20 times why is, isn't that person in jail and, and i know that the correction system is probably overtaxed so it's, that's really a problem in itself. It's more of a societal problem. But I don't, I don't think in the short run would necessarily a, a, a local police department help. I think, if anything, more hours from the state police who already, they could draw in from a larger group of people that, you know, if, if we needed some more help and maybe some more hours, that might be a, a better solution personal opinion. Uh, I'm noticing that we do have uh, someone uh, on, the, uh, on the Zoom uh, who was uh, a uh, noted uh, member of the Vermont State Police and has recently been hired uh, by the city of Burlington to help them with their policing efforts. And uh, Ingrid, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you care to uh, provide us with any information or uh, insights that you might have, that would be greatly appreciated, but uh, you're, you're certainly not under new obligation. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, I'm kind of multitasking and I'm gonna keep my screen off. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, help in any way I can. It's it's really complicated stuff. It's definitely not as um, it's not simple for anyone. Um, I will I did write in the chat because the previous speaker, I can't remember his name, but he inaccurately characterized the series of events in Burlington and I'm learning as I go here, but clearly you mentioned the current mayor as voting to quote, defund the police, which is not what took place. She wasn't part of the city council, so I felt it was important to step up and set that inaccuracy straight. Um, but this is a really layered problem. Um, and nobody wants to see um, people living in the streets, people committing crimes to support um, drug abuse issues, drug use issues. Um, but we have to put our heads together to come up with solutions for it and not sort of act out of fear and our discomfort, which we all have. Um, certainly I have it as well as, you know, everyone I talk to, but um, Burlington and Rutland and, and not just those communities, every community is dealing with people who have fallen through the cracks for various reasons. And it's, I don't have any answers for you. I'm, I'm hired on to help Burlington with their public safety plan. Um, and I'm happy to chime in here and the things that we learn there, but we can learn from you as well. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I, I don't mean to ramble, but I do think it's complicated. And the worst thing we can do is start blaming and pointing fingers and othering people because um, this is, a tough problem for everybody. We didn't necessarily create it, but we have to be part of the solution and come up with solutions and not point fingers um, mm -hmm. in that way. But go ahead, ask me any questions if you have some. I'm happy to chime in. Any questions? Again, uh, Ingrid is a retired uh, major in the Vermont State Police and is currently working as an uh, advisor to the uh, Burlington Police Force. Any Roger, Roger, just to clarify, uh, advisor to the mayor of Burlington right now. I'm, I'm not. Um, 
directly, at, you know, I'm working for the mayor and then working with the different departments in Burlington and with the community to help create a system that works most effectively. Right, I stand corrected. Um, any questions for Ingrid while she's here? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask a I'll question. Go uh, Ingrid, um, since you are working with the mayor instead of the police department, I feel like I can ask this question. Do you feel or does uh, the mayor's office feel like the homelessness problem in the more populated areas of Vermont is a direct result of our affordable housing crisis? I, you know, I can't speak for the mayor, but I think that that is, is a big part of it. It's a combination of um, affordable housing. It's a combination of people falling through the cracks during and after COVID. And, you know, if everybody was, as it sort of was explained to me by somebody who's much more knowledgeable about homelessness, homelessness issues, if everybody was sort of on a ladder somewhere during the pandemic and we all kind of suffered in our different ways and we fell down a rung or two, there are some people who were already at the bottom rung, right? And um, I think it's a combination of societal factors, certainly lack of affordable housing, but also um, the opiate problem that we have um, nationally, worldwide probably. Um, a combination of serious um, social issues. And we have people living on the streets, people who have fallen through the cracks and people who are committing serious crimes. Um, and it's not sustainable. Thank you. Any questions? No? Yeah. Just a quick question, maybe me better, but you can come since, forward if you want. I'd rather not. Okay. Since there are a lot of communities that are probably having similar struggles to what we are and not being able to afford their own police department, are there any examples of towns in Vermont that are actually doing some sort of co uh, community policing that's not like, I mean, there's a lot of definitions for community policing, but are there any towns that are utilizing volunteers to help just provide more people and a presence? at certain times of the day because that's in and of itself, um, you know, a way to sort of deter uh -huh. um, certain crimes. Uh, just yeah. curious as to whether there's something that the community can do as a whole to help out as well. Yeah. Uh, do you hear that? Uh, Lisa's asking if there's yeah. some community policing solutions. I did, I did hear that and I, I can't, I would imagine that there are communities that are doing that. Certainly Burlington Police Department has created um, alternative services other than sworn members of the department. There are other professionals in the department who provide community service. They're called CSOs, community services officers, and there are community service liaisons. So it's civilian professionals who have um, stepped up. That department has hired them to to provide those types of services that are public health related as opposed to crime related um, or crime intervention. And I do think that that is happening. I know that that's happening around the country. Um, you know, we've been studying different models um, where there's like a robust third prong to the public health and safety issues that we're facing. And that third prong is social service related and deals with houselessness and substance use disorder and all of the things that we're, we're seeing that, that we all agree probably isn't best for the police to, to intervene, but somebody has to intervene. Um, and so, yes, I think that is probably what the future will look like is sort of a third equal service. So there's fire and emergency medical services, there's police services doing, you know, crime intervention and response, and then there's a robust public health, for lack of the right exact term that everyone agrees on, but that's dealing with all of the other issues that, that we're seeing everywhere that we know that police and fire aren't best equipped to deal with. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. 
Other questions? Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, what I meant earlier, Ms. Jonas. Um, I didn't say, I, I didn't specifically say that uh, Mulvaney was the one that defunded police. That happened long before she got into office. What I'm saying is that the damage was already done, and now there, the efforts to recruit new officers uh, has come, come up dry because of the circumstance that Burlington's now in. So I just wanted to clarify that. All right. That's good clarification. Thanks for that, and I appreciate it. I definitely was, uh, I'm well aware of the, the crisis in recruiting police officers, which started quite a while ago and has only gotten worse. Um, Burlington and Vermont State Police and, and certainly state and nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, Ingrid, on the, uh, the set at noon time uh, on uh, Vermont Public Radio, uh, the uh, Attorney General is talking about uh, changing uh, the way the police academies run uh, and changing the location all that uh, so that uh, to make the training of police uh, more accessible. Uh, is that anything that you think is, uh, would, would help uh, and is that anywhere close to a reality? So I don't know the status of that. I think it would be it would be worthwhile to bring somebody in. I can connect you with the right person from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council who could kind of give a more articulate update than I can. I know that that has been talked about for a really long time, and I haven't seen, I'm just not up to speed on how viable it is or, or changes. There was discussion before I retired from state police about sort of having a more academic academy that would be a parallel academy um, so there'd be, there would be an academy that was, you know, sort of Monday through Friday, um, more able to accommodate folks who can't go and live in Pittsford and um, be gone for as long a period of time as most uh, everyone has to go through. So that academy is not um, in effect right now. I don't know how far along the discussion is, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can put you in touch with the right person who could give you an update. Um, but it's definitely not, I don't think it's in the near future. I'd go out on a limb and say that without having had an update recently, just because it takes a lot, seems to take a long time. And it's been talked about for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions for Ingrid while she's here? No? Okay, thanks a lot. We appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the mini pumper for the fire department. Do we have someone uh, interested in addressing that issue? Yeah. <coughs> good time. Uh, he says it's well, any It's not though. always good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you're well aware, when the village and town merged, that created a kind of a quandary of the, the drawbacks that we found of buying fire trucks at the same time, town and the village. So the tank truck, that, one of them, that was approved this, this year, uh, that is expected to be in in the April or May time period. So originally scheduled some time ago, uh, working with Bill Sheplock, we had planned on the second tank truck to be replaced, but those are supposed to have been, uh, I won't say they're supposed to have been, originally talked about replacing them in 2018. Um, mm -hmm. But we've, we've held off, mm -hmm. um, but it's like we did last, this past year, it's time to, to move on them. But we had decided to start stretching those out a little bit, uh, like we did with the engines, the, yeah. instead of every, Two in one year, we stretch it out. We're able to get um, some demo, two demo trucks, which saved us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. The tank truck that we're getting is a demo truck, um, saves us money. Uh, and we want to, we've been talking about getting the next tank truck in 2026 to spread them out a little bit. So next year, in 2025, would be a mini pumper. Mm -hmm. And that is used on our back roads where there's a tight fit. Um, 
and it, it's the second fire truck on the interstate because it would have four wheel drive uh, during the winter. The problem that we have with the current, the biggest problem we have with the current one is General Motors, in all their infinite wisdom, um, decided that that model year they were no longer going to make parts. And Waterbury Fire Department is not the only one out there scrounging for parts. Do you have a, a mini pumper for which you can't get parts? Correct. We have a person, uh, Cody Chevrolet found a person or knew of a person in Newport, and it's all electronics, that he is giving it a shot to try and redo some of the electronics on one of the main boards in that mini pumper. We still don't have it back. It's been gone for a while. Um, so we would, if we needed it on a narrow driveway, we literally have to wait for somebody else, or just get a truck in there and hope that we're not like the notch and having to have a record pull a, a big truck out of a long driveway. Um, but that's the problem. Waterbury is not unique to that. There's a lot of um, towns and private contractors that have bought that model year truck and have the same problem. Uh, it, it baffles my mind a little bit, what I have left, um, as to why they would just stop making these electronic parts. But nonetheless, there is a, a mini pumper coming in um, as another demo. Uh, the vendor has put our name on it. And that's actually gonna be in, in, February or March. I, I get that it's got to go to town meeting. Um, I get that there's a, if it's approved, there's a 30 day wait. But he's willing to hold on to that for us. Um, that truck is less than the one that was approved this past year. Um, it's uh, 320,000. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's taking advantage of a vendor that we've had a great working relationship with that is willing to let us have almost first dibs on any demo truck that he's got coming in. Mm -hmm. So after this coming year, if the mini pumper is approved and then we have the tank truck, we're then not gonna, and I get that this has been kind of a. Yeah, it feels like we've been buying a lot of trucks. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we also have probably one of the biggest fleets. But there is that. Um, but then there's a big gap. And we, you will probably, there's members on this board that will not be here when the next one is due. Uh, and there's a, <laughs> even a better chance that I will not be sitting here talking about getting another truck. So uh, it, it is a, it is so a ways out. this is your last, uh, last time I'm going to mention this. This could be the last one. Uh, in in fact, I'm really kind of hoping. Now the key is to hold them to that, and I got to keep them on the, as a chief for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. uh, you know, I've, 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 I've been, your wife is sitting in that chair next time. That's the whole day. That, that, that is her problem. <laughs> uh, if she, I guarantee you, she will say no. Um, I've been I've been fire chief for 22 years, so um, it's you know over the next few years uh, will be time because uh, I think it's it's good to have new blood as long as that new blood is good. Um, so anyways, that's where we're at. We're, we have the opportunity to get this mini pumper. If we don't get it and we delay it, we still have the problem of maybe we can get this part fixed. Mm -hmm. But then what's the next part? Um, is there reason to believe that the GM, is this a GM vehicle that we're buying again? Yeah. yeah. No, we're getting a Ford. Uh, oh, so no, no, no. no. Okay. No. Um, and, and you think so we will have parts? So have well, I would have said I thought that the current one would have parts. Right. Uh, I, if I could see into the future, I'd pick my vacations better. Uh, <laughs> but I can't. Uh, so um, I, I can try and answer any other questions you may have, uh, but that's kind of where we're at. Um, getting demo trucks has saved Town of Waterbury, a lot of money over the last uh, well, few years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask that price tag on the Ford one more time. That is 320. 320. 320. As a demo. Yep. Yep. 
And if you, if you want to know how much they've gone up, uh, I have a, uh, a napkin at my house. They had a, a gathering at the village in 1963 when, it, when a fire truck was, well, they, they had a little gathering, and there was a napkin, a napkin. And oh, okay. for the, they had a little drawing of a fire truck, and uh, that was $63,000 back then. So, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> well, you know, really, uh, <laughs> they're expensive. Yeah. Uh, but trying to replace a, uh, a mini pumper off the line uh, that you're still looking at two or three years down the road, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot more. Um, the demo trucks that we've been getting uh, are, for the most part, ready to go, but they don't have shelves, so we just, I mean, it's just a process of meeting with the vendors, saying, okay, we want this shelf here, this shelf here. Um, so it's, but it saves a lot of money because they're already in line. Yeah. And we don't have to wait. Uh, there, there are departments that are beyond three years waiting for fire trucks. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, did we sell the uh, that other truck to Montpelier? We did mm -hmm. uh, for 150. Um, they sent it up to the same vendor that that we use, and he did some retrofitting to fit their needs, changed the lettering on. I can't imagine why they'd want to take our name off that truck, but <laughs> yeah. apparently they did. Um, and it is now in service. Uh, so it's, and they're very happy with it. That was good to see they lost their truck in a fire. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, it was a strategic call by the officer on that truck to place it where he did. Um, I would have done the same thing. Uh, it, you know, the, the short wind shifted. The wind shifted. There was a report that there was a, a, an employee still in the building that was trapped because of the fire. They placed the truck between the fire and the building to get her out, and it was all working you can well. You replace a truck, right? You can replace a truck. <laughs> There's not a building anywhere that's worth somebody or a person worth a truck. So, the fire got to the end of the lumber yard, and then the wind shifted, and the driver did not have time to back the truck out, so he bailed and ran. But it's a truck. Right. It's not a person. Yeah, Mike. You said this truck is four-wheel drive. What other vehicles in our fleet are four-wheel drive capable? Uh, we have a brush truck. It's a, a short-framed uh, utility body Put with a pump. Brush fires. It's got a yeah for brush fires, and we have a pickup truck, which is also on the same list for next year. Um, that. If somebody's looking for something that turns kind of like an aircraft carrier, it'd probably be a good truck for them. Um, but it's aging. Uh, but it's a uh, it's an F three fifty crew cab long bed. So it's long truck. It's a yeah, it is very a, large. A, yes, <laughs> it is very. We will not get one that large. Uh, we will drop down to. An, to what do you use for your command vehicle? That's it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a multi back and forth turn truck. But fantastic for blocking the road. <laughs> it will block both lanes <laughs> in one shot. Block of fire. <laughs> uh, it will block both lanes. Uh, so yeah, uh, the next pickup would be, you know, a, an F two fifty or twenty five hundred series GMC or Chevy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like it or not, you're getting a crew cab long bed. We are, no, <laughs> uh, we're, we'll get a crew cab, but we'll get the shortest bed possible. And, and we don't need that much space with the equipment that is carried in the back of that truck. Um, but that was literally the only truck in the New England area that they could get uh, at the time. It was just a big rush on trucks back then. Questions for the police chief? Yes. Yeah, see him. Um, I think I can be anything you Gary, want. Gary, what will be what will become of that truck up in Newport right now? Does that have value to it? Right well, now? the truck is actually at Cody's in Montpelier. Oh, gotcha. Um, we've actually 
had a conversation. I, I think there's, I think there is value. Um, I think the discussions that we've had is, you know, it, can the town use it someplace? Take the the pump off um, and use the the body on it or the the cabinets and put, use something else on it, or take that all off and put something else on it. Um, that is, if we can keep it going, yep. it could be a good truck. Sure. Um, but as far as the electronics of the truck to the pump, it's just. That's the problem. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought it might have been like a radio malfunction or your dashboard or something. It's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the electronics to the pump. Yeah, oh, it, okay. well, it, electronics in, in the truck, mm -hmm. but those electronics help run the electronics in the pump. The truck's drivable and movable. Yeah, yeah, you can drive it all over the place. It looks pretty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good grades. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> it, it, I'm sure that it would serve a purpose someplace else, okay. uh, as long as somebody can continue to make those electronic parts. But what year is that truck? Say? Uh, and it is a 2006. It's probably an ongoing problem is that just like we see with all of our personal vehicles, all the electronics now, you know, I used to be able to do all, all sorts of work on my vehicles and now you can't, it's like look at farmers. They, they can't now work on their tractors anymore. They have to bring them into the dealership. Right. It's crazy. I guess my and question is for you, Roger, as, mm -hmm. I, as I made the motion last town meeting day for a new fire truck, may I make <laughs> The motion this town meeting day for a new fire truck. Do my best. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <coughs> uh, yeah, and then then you get next year, and then likely you and I won't be here, or maybe you will. You're I young. Like, oh. <laughs> Look, I'm, 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 I'm on the other end of the. I got I got 33 more years to go before, <laughs> before I'm retired. Enjoy that. <laughs> Okay, uh, do we need a motion today? <coughs> uh, yes, if you want me to sign the documents. Right, we have to order this thing, right? Yeah. So, so you could so authorize me to order it. So. Oh, I can make that And make order approval at town meeting day. Or Gary to order it, doesn't matter to me if he wants to sign it. I, I have the documents, I mean, I can sign it if you want and just send it up to him. He knows that it's contingent upon town meeting day approval. Right. But we have to get the process started, right? Right. Yeah. I move to approve the the signing of the documentation to purchase to begin the purchase agreement for the new mini pump truck. Does that work? That's for me. Second motion. All right. All right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? You don't want to just say I, contingent I, on voter approval. Contingent on voter approval. I maybe as a friendly amendment just to add that the contract with the Sourcy Emergency Products. Oh, the contract with the Sourcy? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Are you good with that? Yeah. yeah, I don't know of another vendor in Vermont that would one, I don't know another vendor in Vermont that I'd want to deal with. Um, yeah, it seems like all our fire trucks go through the Sourcy. He yeah. he has treated us very well. The the aside from the good deals that we get, the upside is he is the only fire truck company or vendor that will service your trucks in Vermont, in your station. Really? Uh, the others are from out of state. They will send somebody up. do the electronics on a... No, I wish he would. I wish he would. Uh, I could call him at 10 o'clock at night. He answers his phone and tell him I need somebody here the next morning, and he'll have somebody here the next morning. That's pretty impressive. Okay, uh, it's been moved in. Yeah, Sandy. Well, just one thing before you sign this. The, yeah. the exemption certificates of the name for the title will be Underhill Dash Town yeah. of Waterbury. You might mm -hmm. want to get rid of the Underhill. Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah. <laughs> That's easy. <Underhill. laughs> Uh, we do not need any underhill trucks. We don't need any underhill trucks. I'm sure there are good trucks up there, but. <laughs> okay. So move, seconded, and amended. Right. Uh, so uh, we're now voting on the, uh, uh, the uh, motion as amended uh, with a friendly amendment. Uh, 
from Mike, and also uh, the fact that we're not putting Underhill on the truck. Um, so all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, congratulations. You're getting a tough knee bumper. Pending well, we'll, we'll the see. approval of taxpayers. Uh, I'm always careful about not getting my hopes up too high. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks, Gary. Thank Move you. Forward. Move forward ourselves. Housing update. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had the uh, head of the uh, Waterbury Housing Task Force, Joe Camerata, come forward um, on a presentation about uh, the uh, proposed housing trust. Uh, and uh, he came forward with a proposal uh, for us, which I uh, thought was, had, had a lot of merit, but we did, we did have some questions. And I asked him um, if he could uh, give an example of how uh, working uh, with a nonprofit had leveraged uh, private funding. And uh, he did come back and uh, gave me a fairly extensive answer, which I'll try to encapsulate now. Unfortunately, Joe is not available tonight. Um, so uh, he, he brought forward uh, the example of the uh, Wyndham and Windsor uh, Housing Trust, uh, which has been in his existence for 35 years. Um, since then, uh, they have... Uh, been able to uh, leverage municipal funding to get uh, $3 million in grants and over $380,000 in private donations. Uh, and with that money, uh, they've uh, worked on creating 25 new units in the village of Windsor, 25 units in the town of Putney, 26 units in Brattleboro, and created nine new shared equity uh, houses, or equity loans. And they've also been working with the uh, Green Mountain House Repair Organization as a partner. And they've uh, implemented uh, 454 projects to restore houses uh, and help them uh, expand uh, from Rochester down to Vernon. So I was impressed uh, with, with that example. The man does his research. <laughs> yes. Something I You're looking for data. Something <laughs> I, I respect greatly about Joe is that he's thorough. Yeah. Yes. So, um, anyways, uh, I, I just wanted to keep this on the agenda. I was hoping that maybe Joe could come forward and, pr and provide that update in person, but. I uh, hopefully uh, provided sort of the encapsulated version. Yeah. And uh, I do think that, uh, I, that we're, we know that housing is a problem here. Uh, this, is, this example does uh, show me that uh, this is a model that can work uh, and could work potentially for uh, Waterbury. Um, and so I'm still interested in uh, potentially putting some uh, funding from the uh, uh, anticipated uh, revenue from the uh, local option tax for 2024 towards this uh, creation of this uh, and funding of this uh, housing trust. But I'll uh, leave it at that and see if there are any comments or suggestions uh, in terms of moving forward uh, at this point. Okay. Um, Joe had suggested in his presentation last meeting to use as seed funding from 2024 from the from the revenue made from the local option tax in regards to short-term rentals as the seed money to kick off the fund, which mm -hmm. I didn't disagree with. Yeah. Um, and I felt as though when we have discussed this in the past um, and funding housing options, questions at this table have always revolved around when we speak about um, work, workforce housing, there's always a question of why don't the employers 
kick some money to a fund like this and when speaking to employers they felt like their contributions to the local option tax were enough um, through the uh, newly implemented uh, local option tax right um, and so if Joe's suggestion was to use the revenue gained from the taxing of short-term rentals uh, my suggestion would be to also visit um, the the taxes on large uh, tourism based employment uh, or employers as uh, an also as also a potential uh, source of revenue for the trust mm -hmm. if that makes sense well uh, I think it so you know, that, uh, in addition to the 1% uh, tax on, uh, on lodging, uh, we uh, would also look at uh, meals. Meals, yeah. Mm -hmm. was, and, uh, I could have said are, that. Are rooms good. and meals separated, Tom? I'm um, trying to log thing. on now. I, I don't recall offhand. Mm -hmm. I don't believe, I think it's alcohol. General retail sales, rooms and meals, I think, are the categories you get. They're all not to one? I think so. so. That's my understanding, too. Yeah, Mike. Can you, when you say large employers. Tour, I said large tourism based. Oh, large tourism based. What's your definition of large? <laughs> over, over 20 employees. Okay. We are a small town. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just curious. You know, are you just looking at the highest, you know? Right. Or I mean, it, we don't have to draw a line at, at 20 employees, but right. But, but just also, getting an yes, idea of what yes, uh, businesses that rely on on staff uh, to who would predominantly <coughs> benefit from living locally. Rooms and meals are indeed separate categories, oh, okay. so we would have actual data there in the future. All right, uh, other comments on this? Ian? Uh, just to clarify, that um, seed money from short-term rentals amounted to 92,000. I traded some emails with Joe Camarada about yeah. that. Um, and what I, looking at 2023, 2023 data from the state, um, rooms in total would have generated $97,000. So I suggested to Joe that ninety-two thousand was probably high. Mm -hmm. if you're, yeah, if that's all rentals, uh, mm -hmm. I would be surprised if short term is uh, that high a percentage of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, okay. I also said I also wanted to say, how, however, I uh, do not disagree with Joe that using <coughs> seed funding from at the municipal level would uh, would entice um, private donors mm -hmm. one thing just to add to from a data perspective if you decide to tie this to rooms in the future we can have perfect data because now that the state has the the three percent tax on short-term rentals we can use that 3% to estimate the 1%, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you looking for action, or are we just commenting? Um, I, you know, uh, what, how much money have we uh, already uh, right. allocated? To, against these uh, anticipated uh, funding that hasn't been budgeted yet. About two thirds, right? Um, give me a minute. The just want to leave us a little room to, <laughs> to act if we need to. I believe it was I'm trying to pull up the memo I sent. I can't get to the networks. I'm going through email, but I believe. I had requested $160,000 to reduce debt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was approved, and I'm, and then there was a third of 70 for Guptill Road, so yeah, 230. 230 is uh, And the projected is 360, right? 
Yeah, three. 350? Yeah, I've been saying 325 to be conservative, but I. Yeah. So that leaves us about 100. Yeah. Are we looking to make a decision in advance of budget discussions? Well, this is for the funding uh, from the, the house. The, yeah, the one time. Yes, this is right. a one time decision about uh, funding from the 2024 revenues from okay. the local option tax. It's not about the 2025 20 budget as of yet. Okay. Uh, yeah, we could either do it now or we could wait until uh, the next session. Just to clarify, uh, John. Is Joe's report or summary available? Um, I didn't see the website. It's in the minutes from our last meeting. Okay, yeah, I was looking through yeah. those and I didn't see it in there. Is it in our minutes or is it in the agenda? I think it's in the minutes. Yeah. Is it in the agenda? I think we've it's in the agenda. It's okay. in the agenda. Okay. And, and to be transparent, it's only half of what he presented because he brought more data with him that night, and I haven't put the limits up because they weren't approved until we got here. So, <laughs> um, so the entire thing will be. I, th I think most of the data you'll see in the minutes is what he presented about our current state of housing, and then he further presented <laughs> proposals and suggestions. Yeah, I was just really interested in the reading of the summary of examples he provided. Mm -hmm. Like we're working on other places we've been on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, can forward you the uh, the link to uh, Wyndham and Windsor uh, Housing Trust, if, if that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, I guess, is that with his summary of breakdown that he broke down for you, too? Uh, I stand corrected. His whole presentation is in the middle. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll check with him. I, you know, he sent it to, to me and Alyssa, um, but uh, he also, I think, uh, will be available uh, in the future. I can check with him as well to, to share that more publicly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, I was just going to say that if we are taking action on this and Tom regarding uh, the rooms as, or the, the short-term rentals as maybe being too high, his projection, um, a lower amount seed funding that maybe more reflects <coughs> the state of short-term rentals. I'm, I, I wouldn't know a number. I would th probably throw one out at like 70,000, but I, I'm unsure at that number. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to see the seed funding begin so that we can then start enticing private donors. Mm -hmm. So it's there. And you suggest you wanted wiggle room in the right. in, in <laughs> incoming uh, tax revenue. Right. Yeah. Um, why don't we just wait for Joe to come up, for, uh, pull all the stuff together, and come up uh, with a proposal for the short sure. meeting. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Any other questions on this one? One more. Just yeah. Quickly, okay. just uh, um, Tom, you said that the. Possible LOT money will be three hundred twenty-five thousand. That's your conservative estimate. That's con conservative estimate for the second okay. half of this year. Want to make sure. I have that. And when did you think you would know exactly <coughs> what it is? Isn't it mid-November? We get our first. So yeah, they. The the process is the state submits us quarterly. Payments. Um, so end of October, will be the end of the first quarter. We collect. They take about six weeks to turn around. Grew up, drew up the money from the, from talking to the auditors. The funds will be will be booked in the period in which it's paid by the customers of the retail businesses. So we will have two quarters of revenue booked for this year. We just won't get it all until mid February. Roger, would we be expecting a, a second Joe presentation at our first November meeting? That's what I'll ask him. Okay. Uh, and, uh, for you as soon as I get it. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is the rental registry outreach. Um, do you have uh, the 
Yeah. See it on that. Yeah. So staff are continuing to work with our new zoning software of which rental registry will be a part of mm -hmm. and the date that we believe that would be up and live the target date is december 1st so the hope is to have to make it easy for people so they're not clicking through our website and seven links down they get to where they need to go to make it easy um, and we think this is something we can accomplish because it's not there's not a, it's a series of questions. It's not a complex form that needs to get input by people. Um, and there's no fee. So the, the plan would be, um, once we're sure we hit that date, that we're doing Facebook front porch form. And then the thought was direct mailings, because we can do a, essentially a postcard option to every property owner in town. That way we're truly getting everyone, because we don't profess to know them all already. That's why we're getting the date in the first place. So there will be a cost of that um, of a few grand. Um, I'm not sure we'll need to repeat that mailing every year as people re-up into the registry. Um, but I think for the first time, it's a good investment. And then finally, talking to the Short-Term Rental Association, they've had real good luck reaching out to the, the Verbos and the Airbnbs of the world, and they communicate to their clients directly. Um, so other towns have had good compliance. So I think we can. Um, I think we can get there. I don't know if the board had any other specific ideas about what they wanted to see um, in terms of outreach, but I think direct mailing every property owner in town is going to be yeah, pretty I, effective. Yeah, I thought the um, postcard idea was a good one and uh, relatively inexpensive. Yeah, I'd like to pair it with. I don't want to make it overly complex, but I'd like to pair it with some sort of announcement about reappraisal. Oh. <laughs> Tie Tie the box. <laughs> Had the reappraisal fund pay half the postage. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. Get I don't want to make it five pages long, but if I can. It's tough to make a five page postcard. Uh, right? Not to say fold. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Something like a Viking brochure, which I get a lot of. Um, you say Viking or biking? Uh, it's for people nearing retirement age. So they're looking to go on a cruise of their lifetime. You know, oh. To go through the heart of I was Europe, concerned the, uh, you were getting yeah, postcards from Vikings. Be a little careful about cruises <laughs> of their lifetime. This don't, is don't know if helicopters involved. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't afford a helicopter. Sorry. Um, yeah, uh, any other uh, thoughts on the uh, rental registry outreach? Uh, I do think uh, the idea of uh, letting people know about the reappraisal is, is also a good one. Uh, Should we have a keyword in the TextMyGov software for um, rental registries? Yeah, we can do that. I just want to further say how cool I think that software is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on that? Yes, Ian. Um, and thoughts about residents that live outside of town? Is that a forward <coughs> address to? So if we do it um, in our system, we've got we've got the difference between local property address and mailing address, so we should get them all. Okay. Twenty-four hundred. Twenty-four hundred. The tax bills, right? Yeah. yeah. If they get their tax bill, they'll get the right. postcard. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, anything else on that one? Otherwise, we can move on to uh, the next meeting agenda. Well, we are way ahead of schedule. Yeah. Um, don't have much on there as of now, but we do have a number of things that have been proposed. One we do need the joint town EFA. Oh, yeah. So, and you would like to do that earlier? Uh, if possible, I think that's six works pretty well. Six o'clock. Um, do we need that much time? I think, yeah, we'll need an hour for sure. Okay. More than that, 5.30? I think 5.30 might be preferable. 5.30, joint meeting with EFA. To talk about uh, 
is, um, so what's um, <coughs> health insurance? Health insurance is, yeah. We talk about town and EFUD cross charges, if you will. Um, and then my annual review. Right. <laughs> the health insurance information by then? Yeah. I've already <coughs> talked with Alyssa about uh, an approach to your review. I can clue in the rest of the time here too. Um, We're going to put keywords and hats. <laughs> we have to draw. Yeah, I have the great pleasure of having an annual review at the same time when we're discussing 20% health, health insurance right. increases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can get it down to 7%, you might get a better review. No, but, no I can't say that. <laughs> no, being that it's a joint meeting, do you want me to ask Kaya if she would be moved? That would be great, yeah. That'd be oh, fantastic. yes, we will not have... Someone yeah. who will be organizing a little uh, I can't election. Promise issue. that she'll be mm -hmm. uh, receptive, but I can ask. Yeah. Okay. I'm meeting the day before election day. Does Kaya keep the minutes for Ethan? Yeah. All right, um, and then uh, on the regular agenda for the uh, select board, we've got the housing task force, no, uh, yes. housing trust fund. Yes. Housing task force. Uh, Kane, you indicated to me that uh, the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee is going to have well, they are finished the draft of the uh, mm -hmm. manual uh, by the 28th of October. One can only hope. Well, <laughs> that's what I was told. There were, is yes. that the, what the, we can only hope? No, oh, no, I was told that, that by, the, by okay. the end of their meeting on the 28th, it will be, complete, it will be a completed draft. Okay. okay, and they will deliver it to crew? Yes. Um, well, that's the question is we don't that's, know whether crew will Right, have that, that will be a question it. for crew. Yeah. Because once it's in their hands, it's out of the control of the committee. All right, well, let's put that on there and then just see if that pans out. Um, or do you, or I do you think I it's smarter to go for the 18th? I would say the 18th, when I spoke with um, members of crew, they indicated that they would need several weeks yeah, to... This, Liz is going to be pretty light up. So the mid-November. Yeah. Right. So. Right. Yeah, that's the uh, 18th of November. Yeah, we'll sell the let's, let's try the 18th. Uh, 18th. Okay, because you never know when one of these things is going to show up. Um, a flood? Well, <laughs> excessive rain. Mm -hmm. Although it's been very nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Wonderful the, the, eastern, the eastward winds have been very helpful. Eastward? Or southeast, whatever. Blowing it out to sea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We call those things, but that's technicality. Um, all right. And so, what else do we say we want to put on this? Um, oh, yes. The yes, Worcester, Worcester Management, Management Plan. plan. Managing Worcester. Worcester Range Management Plan. I'll ask again if they can do that on the fourth. And anything else that uh, has been sitting in the... Lisa's, Lisa's got her it. hand up. Oh, sorry, yeah. On November 4th, there'll be a few days after November 1st, when the armory should be opening as a shelter. Maybe Ooh, shelter should be, yes. An update, An update on, on that? Whether that's happening yeah. or mm -hmm. where that stands, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll know more by then. As I said before, one can one only can hope. hope. <laughs> <laughs> sure, mm -hmm. that on. Uh, how about the outreach plan for Woody Avenue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. Are we changing that sign? Is there, I don't believe there's a sign there yet. Mm -hmm. There's no houses there, so. Mm -hmm. 
It's an avenue mm -hmm. with no addresses at this point mm -hmm. and no street sign. But it's, it's a safety issue. Uh, people trying to navigate uh, the hill section. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should name the, the plot with the with the asbestos mm -hmm. roof garage uh, Woody, Woody's plot. <laughs> Woody's place. Woody's place. <laughs> Have we been decided upon the employee appreciation? Ah, good one. Mm. It is. Mm -hmm. It is scheduled for uh, yes. the fifteenth. It's scheduled November. for the fifteenth, mm -hmm. which is a Friday. I've got to amend my email because I talked to Skip on Friday. Um, historically, you start. People arrive at the volunteers who cook arrive at six. I said in my email, food is served at seven, and Skip said no. Food's always been served at eight. We it takes takes a while. It takes more more time than you think to cook. So I've got to send an amendment to that email saying eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. where, where are we holding this? At Leo's. So and at some point, as we get closer, I'll ask for a rough head count from. But I, I send it to all the staff here and said, if you know, for those of you that work with boards, specifically invite your boards. And, Mm -hmm. So we should probably put that on the for final plans, you know, for the first. Okay, yeah. good idea. And it's, this is also with EFUD, uh, so then we can maybe do that as part of the EFUD meeting. Sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll be there cooking at six. So. <laughs> you think uh, November fifteenth will stick? Yeah, I okay. think so. And we reserve to the hall. Yeah, I mean the, the week before is tax due date, so that doesn't work. You know, we don't want to get too late in the year and interfere with holidays. I think November 15th is good. Okay. All right. Any other suggestions for the agenda? Mm -hmm. Parade permits. I'm just kidding. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not parade season. Well, actually, you know, there will be. There a will be a parade. There will be a uh, River of Light parade uh, the first, the first Saturday in uh, December. But we've already approved that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Although, related to parades and, and, and QID, we have, in essence, competing parties who want to use the field next year. So at some oh, point, oh, we should yeah. address that. At some point, that'll have to be addressed. It's, it's um, flea yeah. I haven't written a draft policy for mm -hmm. consideration. I'm the not sure we have policies. Flea it's only occurred <laughs> once, but well, we got to have something to go on. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Let's coin toss. Coin toss is a. Right. Fair, obviously. I'll write, I'll write something up that okay. All right. is a little more media than a coin toss, but it's not going to be a novel. Mm. All right. Maybe we shoot for uh, the 18th for that one as well. Okay. Well, could, you know, they could just split the field, one on one half, one on the other. I don't think that's the solution either. Yeah. Yeah. Either one. <laughs> you will be happy with that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, are we going to need an executive session today? I actually would like a short executive session. Okay. I won't request pleasure. any action, but it would be for the um, evaluation of a public officer. So what is the... Mm -hmm. All right, uh, a public officer? Yes, the statute allows for an appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. It could also be termed appointment of a public officer. Okay. So it's, a, uh, it's so an internal it's matter? A concerning uh, personnel that would. Uh, okay. I move to find that premature public knowledge of an internal matter would place the town at a significant disadvantage. Do I hear a second? Uh, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, now, do I have another motion? I move to enter executive session. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We are now moving into executive session.